Oxnard is probably not exactly the hotbed of metaphysical territory. I don't know if I lived someplace bigger, if, if it would make any difference. I think just living in Southern California makes it okay. It would be tough if I lived in South Carolina or, or someplace like that. You ready to go? You ready to go for a walk, Jezebel? I remember some of my first psychic experiences now looking back, but at the time, I kind of saw everything as normal. I didn't really see anything that I was doing as out of the ordinary. I grew up in Ventura, California, and had a fairly normal childhood. Leave it to be kind of thing. My parents were traditional. I was taught not to question things because that was showing a lack of faith. So if I had questions about things they were telling me in church, I got a lot of trouble for asking questions if it didn't make sense to me. My parents' attitude toward the paranormal was, even if you read your horoscope in the, in the newspaper for fun, that was dangerous and that was considered a sin and don't ever do it seriously or you're gonna go to hell. I knew stuff about people. I kind of understood their motives and what was going on behind their words. They don't argue that I have some ability and I can know things that there's no explanation for. But for a long time they were worried that, that it was coming from maybe an evil source. So I kind of kept my opinion to myself. I started making a split from the church when I was old enough to refuse to go. And it was tough on my parents, you know, they kind of put some a little bit of barriers up between us. I pretty much dated and worked and held a single life until when I met Steve. We got married in 88. My abilities, I think, really started showing up when the kids were born. I think I've started feeling a lot of connection with the kids almost telepathically. I'd hear the phone ring and um, I'd walk over there to pick it up and then it would really ring. And I'd go, whoa. That's when the dreams started. I started having the dreams that I realized were coming true. When I dreamed about the plane going down in New York. Why did I have this foreknowledge? I mean, that's, that's a horrible thing to know that this is gonna happen and there's nothing you can do. One night I had a dream about a little girl um, drowning. The next day I saw in the headlines about this little girl by this name who had drowned. As these things started happening, you know, you can't, you can't dismiss it anymore. You're going, something is going on here. So I went and talked to a friend of mine who had been studying metaphysics for 20 years. She felt that by hypnotizing me, we could get information and it wouldn't be so traumatic for me. And that coincided with um, the very first case I worked on. One night I had this dream that I was in the back seat of this blue green Altima. We were driving down this curvy road. I knew the people in front and the person in front was my husband and this woman in front of me was his girlfriend. However, it wasn't really my husband, I mean, it wasn't Steve. So I knew that in the dream I was somebody else. I was experiencing what somebody else experienced. And I was arguing with this woman. And at some point I realized that I was in grave danger, that their intentions were, were bad, and I woke up. Three days later, I'm looking in the newspaper and I see that a woman is missing. It was somebody actually I went to high school with. And that her husband and girlfriend are the main suspects. They had rented a car, the blue green Altima. And they turned the car back in two days later, blood soaked. At that point I knew, oh my God, that's her. It's gotta be her. I mean, there's just, there's, you know, I know that I was seeing through her eyes and I know who did this. 
I went to Beverly. She hypnotized me. And so I asked for more details about the crime, and I was able to see her location. Though I didn't know what road it was, I knew she was right next to a road, and I knew she was in this embankment where the little trickling stream. And I could see her as plain as day. I knew that she was killed by a blunt force to the back of her head. And every weekend they were holding a search party. And I was just racked with guilt. I mean, it felt horrible, because I knew that I could help. So I went down there, and I said, um, I think I know where she is. They all kind of gathered around, and they said, well, what do you know? And so I told them what I had seen. And they decided to take me to the house where she lived, and to maybe get me some of her jewelry or something to hold. I didn't expect to come face to face with the husband. He came out and he took one look at me and he said, oh, you must be the psychic that they've got working. Since I'm very good at seeing through people, I could see through him and he was terrified. And I, I remember thinking it was kind of funny because I didn't know who was more terrified of who. He told me that we'd never find her because she was too deep. And I looked at him, I looked him in the eyes, he's lying to me. And he was doing a lot of things to block me, like he'd get really close to me. And it was stressing me out and upsetting me. And, and so I couldn't pick anything up because he was scaring me, because he didn't want us to find her. He didn't help with the search party, nothing. He was very cocky and arrogant. They had a big van set up with maps all over the side. So we got yellow highlighters, and we started highlighting all the places that fit my description. I went out with the search party, trampling through bushes and going through all the places that seemed to fit. So after we had searched a couple of places and we didn't find her where I thought we were going to find her, I started getting discouraged. But I was really determined that we were going to find her that day. I mean, I was really determined that the family was going to, the suffering was going to stop because it just wasn't fair. I mean, they were just, they were dying inside. And then I decided to go on home. And it was maybe um, two hours later, I got a phone call. And they said, we found her. They had found her on a deserted road up in the hills. She was less than 100 yards from the road. And she had been dumped down this ravine. That's what he was saying, by she's too deep, because she was 30 feet down. The autopsy report showed that she was killed by a blunt blow to the back of the head. She was brutalized horribly, and I didn't know any of that. I didn't pick up any of that psychically, thank God, because she was stabbed like 50 times, and she was beheaded. When they found her down in the ravine, they also found her next to the body of a goat. The boyfriend and the girlfriend were into Satanism, and she was actually a human sacrifice for his birthday. And I don't think anything's ever scared me so bad as dealing with him, because that's the first time I've ever faced evil. I mean, come face to face with darkness. So I think she died before all of the trauma, and I was able to tell that to her family. I was really able to talk to them on a spiritual level. It was a, a flood of all kinds of emotions. That time was tough for for me and my husband because he kind of scoffed at it and made fun of it and didn't believe a lot of what I was saying. And when we found that missing woman, that was kind of a turning point for him where he was going, okay, <laughs> you found someone. <laughs> I mean, within a week, I was working on another case. So I felt pretty much like, okay, <laughs> Here we go, I guess this is, this is what we're gonna do. Another family heard about my involvement. Their daughter had been killed. Her name was Gloria de la Cruz. She was a mariachi singer, she was 18 years old. She had gone to bed one night and kissed her mom goodnight and the next morning she was gone. She had been dumped in a dumpster in Los Angeles. And again I went and got hypnotized. I got a name, I got a license plate, 
a car, the personality of the guy, why he did it, how he did it, what route he took her on. I knew the whole scenario. It was like watching the whole thing take place when they finally did make an arrest. I had said his name was Rosengren. His name was Robinson. He drove the car that I had said. Certain aspects of his personality were right on, I mean, right on the money. He confessed behind closed doors and told the detectives that he drove down PCH exactly the way I had said. And at that point, I was going, wow, <laughs> wow. You know, it, I was amazed. So my life was all of a sudden spiraling out of control. Here I was, this mom with three kids, and all of a sudden people were calling me and asking me to do this. It was mind-boggling for me and my husband. We would be out doing something with the family, and I would just burst into tears. And he'd be going, what? You don't like your taco <laughs> or something? You know, he had no idea the emotional impact of what I had been through. He couldn't keep up with the changes. and. Uh, I was just becoming a completely different person than I was just a few years ago. I mean, a completely different person. I saw the world differently. I saw everything differently. He was the kind of person who, if he hates change, he likes things to stay the same. I felt kind of alone because he didn't understand. Ultimately, we split up. We'd been uh, together for about nine and a half years when we split up. I get several letters a week asking for help. And they're usually asking for help finding a missing person. Lots of missing people out there. I get calls from all over the country and all over the world. I don't take compensation for um, criminal cases or missing person cases. I couldn't work out a system where I felt comfortable profiting from someone else's tragedy. Tonight we are having hamburgers and french fries. I used to have a pager and I would get paged at all hours and all the time and we couldn't go out to eat. So I finally got rid of the pager and said, you know, okay, <laughs> forget it. We've been doing this for three years. In some ways it's easier, I think, than it was when I was married. All right, does anybody need anything? We've created our own traditions. Okay, so who's going to go first? I'm grateful I had a good day at school. You did? You have a track meet tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. Nicholas, of all the kids, has had the most profound, insightful dreams. Ever since he was three or four, he's shown different psychic abilities. If he continues to nurture this and work on it, it's going to be amazing. I mean, he's going to be amazing. Hmm, I think it was pretty strange to read your mind. What did you think when I told you that you kept reading my mind, that I was thinking stuff? I you thought would it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was weird one time. A bus came by with black windows and there was an um, Esplanade sign. When it drives by with the windows like that, I can still see the sign bright. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mm -hmm. can I see through things or what? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. That's what it's kind of telling you, yeah. I don't know if it's a gift or a curse. I thought, well, he's got it. All I can do is be there for him and help him through it. You know what you seem to be pretty good at? What? You seem to be pretty good at knowing how people are feeling. Oh, yeah. I'm good at that. Yeah. You know what that's called? That's called empathic. Ah. This award, it's um, the most important award you can ever get. It's the student of the month. The best student of the month. <laughs> if you were trying to explain to your friend what it was like to feel this way or to have empathy for somebody, how would you describe it? Well... Just kind of, I feel deeply about people's thoughts and how they feel. 
these are Pokemon. And he doesn't really talk much about the psychic aspect, so I don't think he's that aware, really, as much as his brother. Do you know what a psychic is? A person that knows a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. like um, six kids. Six kids? What do I do? What kind of job do I do? Mm -hmm. You try to help kids before, um, before, um, the, the kidnappers, um, yeah. Over the course of maybe six months to a year, I developed this program called Smart Hearts because I learned so much about how kids were kidnapped and how kidnappers worked, and there were a lot of similarities. I felt it was important that they learned if somebody made them feel scared, that they learned to honor those feelings instead of shutting them down. You know, it could actually be a life-saving skill. And I'll be starting my next school uh, Monday. They had two incidents just this week of men pulling up and, and saying things to little girls who are walking to school. I keep the psychic part under wraps because you have to be very careful not to upset the uh, religious right. There's still this part of society who will hang you. <laughs> And there's still laws throughout the state that it's illegal to give readings and you can still get thrown in jail. I kind of need to keep it a secret. And why? Um, I think it's kind of annoying that people ask me to read their mind and I think it'd be nice to keep it a secret. Plus they might get jealous. <laughs> so that's up to you, huh? Who you decide to tell and who you don't tell? Is it kind of hard to decide sometimes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody's got this latent ability. Most of us spend a great deal of our lives making sure it stays closed off, like my parents. Um, we receive stuff, but we do everything we can to ignore it or deny it or dismiss it. For me, I never know what's around the corner because it's never what I think. My life takes drastic turns all the time. I've probably worked on 50 plus cases. Readings kind of come and go. I, you know, I'll get swamped with requests and then I'll go through a lull. Stephanie beats me at this game all the time. Okay, I'm gonna say red. Ding, ding, ding. Black. Ding, ding, ding. Black. Ding, ding, ding. Me and mom. <laughs> All right. I could just feel a whole shift in society, and that's part of my goal in working with kids, is to kind of take that whole generation and say, you know, don't shut it down. It's okay. This is good for you. It's there to help you, because it changes your whole world view, and you go through an amazing shift where you see the world completely differently than you did before. Start having a little more respect for the little miracles that happen around all the time.